This is a joint work with many colleagues from ETH Zurich and from Arma Swiss. And the example with which I would like to start has actually at first sight nothing to do with computer networks, but it is about the telephony system in the 1960s. Back then, the phone companies used the same channel to transmit voice signals and the control signals that they used to uh, enable uh, and bill calls. And what this allowed was, uh, and people figured that out, that they could inject control signals. In particular, they could play sound at a certain frequency, and this sound would, use, would be interpreted as a signal to enable a, a phone call. And uh, therefore, by literally by blowing a whistle, they could, people could enable long-distance free phone calls without paying for them. And uh, some of you might wonder why I'm starting with this example. I guess many of you already see the connection to the trend in potential future network architectures, where uh, there are very many proposals around to make future networks data-driven, self-driving, uh, experience-driven, somehow intelligent in some way. And uh, this could actually lead to a similar problem then with the phone network in the 1960s. If we look at it a bit more from a technical perspective, today we have network devices consisting of data plane and control plane, and if we have two devices, they would use separate channels to, commu to transmit data between each other and to communicate um, control information, such as routing protocol messages. Uh, yeah. And if, uh, if I'm now an attacker in such a network, it's quite hard to attack the control plane of the network. So what I'm basically left with is using the network as a carrier to attack other devices that are connected to this network. But now if we change this for future networks, and if we make the behavior of the network dependent on the traffic that is sent in the network, then uh, we actually partially merge the control channel and the data channel, and we allow an attacker to uh, also attack the control, the, the decisions of the network. And this is uh, something that we discuss in our paper. In particular, we uh, describe some examples for uh, how to attack uh, self-driving network applications, and also we propose uh, some solution at the high level which could be uh, investigated further in future research. So I will start with the uh, attack uh, part now. For the uh, attack, we assume three different attackers with three different privilege levels. The most powerful would be the operator level attacker, which can uh, basically do everything in the network, including changing the algorithms that are running on the, on the network devices, such as switches or routers. Then we have a man-in-the-middle attacker who can uh, access and modify traffic on one or multiple links. And we have the host-based attacker, which can control um, one or multiple hosts and modify traffic that is coming from or is going to these hosts. For the attack targets, we distinguish two cases. The first target would be the network infrastructure itself. So for example, an attack against the network infrastructure would be one to modify the forwarding behavior of the network. And we have attacks against endpoints, for example, to um, tamper with the performance of uh, data-driven uh, applications running at the endpoints. So a few more words about uh, attacks against network infrastructure. Um, there are many uh, proposals today. This is just a random sample of um, systems that try to leverage the, these uh, increased uh, possibilities in data plane programmability, programmability to make uh, networks smarter or to integrate more applications into the network. And if we abstract away a bit, we can say that the behavior of a network is kind of defined by two um, properties. First, by the algorithms that are running in the, in the network, so for example, by the routing protocol, and second, by the, by the state of these algorithms, for example, the contents of the forwarding table. If we want to attack these um, properties, uh, we need to be an operator level attacker to attack algorithms because the other attackers cannot change the software that is running on devices. For the, for the state of the algorithms, however, especially if the algorithms are, are data driven, so if the state depends on the traffic that is exchanged in a network, um, this can be attacked by all the three different uh, attacker uh, levels. And these attacks can have severe consequences. I will show a concrete example later. Um, one consequence is uh, that there could be privacy violation if 
if the attack leads to traffic being redirected maybe to a point where an attacker can eavesdrop it. It can have a performance impact in a way that the performance of the network might be worse because traffic is no longer sent along the optimal path. It can have reachability problems if traffic is not reaching the destination at all. And in case the network becomes so bad that customers move away from it, it can even lead to revenue loss for the operator. As a concrete example for such an attack, I will now uh, describe Blink. This is a paper for fast connectivity recovery in the data plane. It is um, coming from uh, people from our group, so there is some overlap between the authors of the paper that I'm presenting and the authors of the Blink paper. And what they do basically is that Blink is monitoring traffic, for example, this blue traffic towards the destination prefix here on the right, and uh, it tries to uh, reach from this traffic whenever there is a problem in reaching that destination. So normally, if we look at one flow, and let's say this is a TCP flow, then uh, you would see packet one, packet two, packet three, packet four, packet five, and so on. But if there is a problem now, so for example, if this link here fails, then um, if the, the flow uses TCP, you would see retransmissions of the same packet. So suddenly you see packet five, 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 five. And Blink would uh, detect this and um, conclude from this that there is a problem with the network, that it cannot reach this uh, destination at some point. And uh, it uses this information to just send the traffic along another path. And now it uh, sees again increasing uh, packet numbers, and it would know that the packet now re traffic now reaches the destination again. This is, of course, a highly simplified uh, version of how this uh, Blink system works, but um, I think it, uh, it covers the main idea. And uh, so that's for, for the non-malicious, uh, no, from a non-malicious perspective, where this approach helps to reroute traffic much faster than when one would wait for, the, for a BGP message, for example, to arrive and to reroute uh, at this time. But if we look at this now from an adversarial perspective, we can and assume that we have an adversary who can eavesdrop on this link. Um, this adversary could just inject packets that uh, look like there is, a there is a problem. So the adversary can just re inject retransmit packets. Everybody can send uh, TCP packets, or everybody can send packets, and they might look like retransmissions in TCP, even though they are not. And uh, by this, an uh, attacker could force Blink to reroute traffic onto the path that uh, she can eavesdrop. And this, again, is a highly simplified version of the attack. We have a uh, more detailed theoretical and practical analysis of it in the paper. Then the second type of attacks would be against endpoints. Here, um, again, we see a trend towards more and more data-driven applications also that run on the endpoints of a network, so at hosts or servers. And we can say these applications use three different sources of information. The first can be information from packet headers, so for example, sequence numbers. Second, there can be information from uh, metadata, like timing information, round trip time, or inter-packet time. And there can be information encoded in the payload, such as application-specific measurements. And if we, uh, as an attacker, want to modify this information, <coughs> headers and metadata can be modified basically by everybody who has access to, the, to a packet, because the, these are typically not encrypted or authenticated. The payload today is mostly encrypted, so this uh, can only be modified by the host which sends or receives these uh, packets. And the uh, impact of attacks uh, in that case are similar to the ones I described before. We can have security and privacy issues if, the, the, for example, destination addresses of packets are modified. We can lose situational awareness if, the, if measurements are manipulated that then um, build the foundation for the, net, for the applications to take some decisions. Uh, we can have uh, loss of performance and we can have uh, broken debugging tools if, for example, ICMP messages are modified. As an example, in that case, uh, we looked at Pythias, which is a data-driven uh, system to optimize quality of experience uh, through a real-time exploration and exploitation process. Again, a very simplified version of it would be that uh, Pythias runs at the server, which uh, provides some video streaming to a bunch of clients. And then all these clients would report back the quality 
that they uh, observe, and Pythias would use this information to decide on uh, which quality or which bitrate of the video it would uh, send to each of these clients. And because it doesn't scale to do this at the per client basis, so to, to do this optimization for each client individually, Pythias groups clients based on some features, for example, based on the geolocation, and it would save, serve the same video quality to everybody within the same uh, group. So for example, a high quality video to uh, one uh, group and a slightly lower quality video to another group. Now, if we look at this from the perspective of, of an attacker, uh, what this could do is try to uh, manipulate the measurements that some of the hosts um, report back to the server. And by this, so if, if these uh, hosts all report bad quality, bad quality, then maybe Pythias would decide to send a lower quality video to the entire group. And this would have an impact on, also on the non-malicious people within the same group. Okay, so that was for the for attacking self-driving networks. Next, I will uh, list some possible countermeasures, which we only describe at the high level and which uh, we suggest that would be uh, interesting for future research. For this, I will uh, use the analogy of a self-driving car, which we want to protect. And in particular, we want to make this self-driving car kind of moving along a road in a, in a safe way. And uh, I will describe all the countermeasures with this kind of picture uh, in the background. We have in total five different countermeasures that we list in the paper, uh, which is uh, testing and verifying the, the, the program that is running in the self-driving network, obfuscating its behavior, um, verifying and improving the input quality, uh, model the state in which the network is currently, and monitor the behavior of the network and try to limit the, the possi possible decisions it can take. And for time reasons, I will only mention, I will only go into the details of two of these techniques, input verification and behavioral monitoring. To uh, make sure that network, that inputs that such a network device receives are, um, are not malicious, one could try to uh, implement some cryptographic uh, primitives such as encrypting or authenticating the input. However, this is hard because it uh, requires complex operations which are, especially in the case of these uh, data plane applications, are not supported. One could use many different inputs, so instead of relying only on uh, one signal like retransmission, one could use another uh, signal to make sure that there is really a problem in the network and by this making it harder for an attacker to fake all the possible uh, inputs that one observes. And one could try to verify input signals, for example, by active probing. If, the, if it looks like there is a problem in reaching a destination, one could actively send a packet to this destination and check whether it really doesn't reach it. And the research question that we uh, propose in, in towards uh, investigating this uh, type of defense is to find a sweet spot where this input quality is maximized while we uh, keep the cost of either modifying existing protocols, applications, or the increased decision time uh, low. The second type of defense that I would like to describe is a more general framework where we propose to have an external uh, kind of supervisor component which uh, monitors the network or the state of the network application and it uh, maintains some model of uh, what the network is doing at the moment. It would uh, receive updates from the network application and then use this information to decide uh, what are possible next, uh, next states for the network, so uh, which decisions would be plausible uh, to take for the network application and in which case would it still uh, run within a benign circumstance and not be under adversarial inputs. So this would have some advantages that um, because this supervising component runs offline, it would not impact uh, performance and it would still uh, it, it could check the behavior of the network while still giving the application some freedom in which it, uh, it can decide and act immediately on network traffic. Uh, but of course, just uh, computing these models, um, describing this interface and so on, these are all complex uh, questions which are highly non-trivial to solve and which we uh, propose to address in future research. 
So that was about uh, attacking and defending self-driving networks. Um, before I finish my talk, I have some uh, greetings from my advisor, uh, who is uh, <laughs> maybe watching now, and uh, he would like to let you know that there is an open position for a professor or assistant professor in cyber-physical and embedded systems, and that there are open positions for PhD and postdocs in uh, networking uh, group. So with this, I'm at the end of my talk, and I'm looking forward to the discussion.